It's September 2019, one of the deadliest months of the 20-year U.S. occupation of Afghanistan. On September 6th, a joint U.S.-Afghanistan military raid takes place at a compound in rural Afghanistan. It's allegedly a special operation to kill terrorists from outside Afghanistan who've taken refuge there. The facts of the mission are disputed, but everyone inside, a man, his wife, and five children, are killed, except for a two-month-old baby girl who is found in the rubble. She has a fractured skull, a broken femur, and second-degree burns. And after the raid, American soldiers rush her to a military hospital. And from here on out, she's referred to as Baby Doe. Baby Doe spends months in the hospital recovering, with the Department of Defense acting as her physical and legal guardian because, you know, they just killed her entire family. The Red Cross, as is standard, begins the process of determining her identity and locating the next of kin, eventually granting custody to her paternal cousins. Meanwhile, U.S. Marine Corps attorney Joshua Mast, who's in Afghanistan, begins an aggressive campaign to adopt her. Fast forward a year and a half, Afghanistan is collapsing because of the Taliban resurgence after the U.S. withdrawal. Mast is back in Virginia, and he has been in contact with her new guardians, and he actually convinces them to visit the U.S. to get the baby medical attention and avoid the upheaval. Upon arrival, Mast presents an Afghan passport for the baby with his surname, takes the couple to an undisclosed building, and then kidnaps the baby. Today, Baby Doe is three and a half years old, still with the masts, and the subject of multiple complex federal investigations and lawsuits. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Invisible Hate. I'm Asad Bhatt. And I'm Sadia Khan. Sadia, how's your week been going? My week's been going good, Asad. So last weekend, I went to the city to meet an old friend who was visiting New York with her family from D.C. And we hadn't talked in a while, but I kid you not, it felt like nothing. And I mean, nothing had changed when we saw each other, we had this relaxed conversation and spent time just reminiscing about our experiences in Denver, Colorado. So it was fun weekend. Oh, that's great. And it tells me how with true friends, you don't have to call them every week or every month. Even if you don't call them for months, you can still catch up and feel the same way. I don't know if you've had those experiences, Asad. No, sadly, I don't have any friends anymore. They've all, <laughs> they're, they're all back in Boston. And no, no. yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I have a bunch of friends that I feel the same way is that, and especially as we get older and we've kind of physically distance wise, you know, gone apart. It's nice when we get back together and we can kind of just pick up and, and laugh and joke and reminisce and all that kind of stuff for sure. So, you know, the interesting thing is I don't like to call people. I can text. You call me all the time, Sadia. No, but that's for different reasons, Asad, because you don't... Oh, I'm not your friend? I'm so insulted. I know you're my friend, but you know, you're also my co-host and co-producer, so we have a lot to discuss. But with my <laughs> friends, I prefer to see them in person or not call them at all. Is Sadia, that you made my favorites list like a year ago, like, you know, on my phone. And I don't have a lot of people on there, <laughs> you know. You're on there now, and now you're going to move move on up. Yeah, but you... do you call people? I actually do call people. Do you like calling? I actually don't mind it, especially when I'm out walking my dog. You know, it's it's nice to talk to people. Sometimes I get bored with podcasts. Not this one, obviously. But <laughs> yeah, I don't mind talking to people. And most recently, because of the baby, I've been FaceTiming with my parents and my family every day, almost every day, which is completely different. I mean, that's like next level from phone call, right? So do you FaceTime with a lot of people? I FaceTime my parents and that's because they are in Pakistan and I miss them and I have to see them. So that's something that I do. But I will 
restate what I said. I don't call my friends, but I do call my siblings and my parents. I really have no reason not to call my friends, but I like texting them or meeting them in person, which I did with this friend after. Yeah, that's really nice. I don't know how many years, Asad, but I should call her more often. The real question is whether your kids call or FaceTime you. Ah, that's a sore topic, Asad. And, and my your husband. Daughter, I mean, these are the, these are the real questions, Sadia. This... They don't. They don't, <laughs> Asad. <laughs> None of them do. So my husband, Vikas, he travels a lot. He's a management consultant. And every time I, he travels, I complain that he doesn't call. We text. We exchange texts. But beyond that, there's there's no conversation. And he blames it on his family because they don't call each other. So he thinks that's why he doesn't. And then with my kids, my older one who's in college now, um, she'll call when she needs something or when she's freaking out about something. <laughs> but other than that, she doesn't. It's unconventional love, right? <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. I can't wait to meet your family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I would love to. When are you coming to Boston, by the way? I'll be in Boston in the middle of June, going there for a week and a half. And then I'm coming out to your deck of the woods in August for a wedding. And so that'll be exciting as well. Hopefully we can meet up and, yeah, meet your family or meet you or meet like us and, and have a good meal. It would be awesome if I don't go to Pakistan, by the way. Oh, that'll be exciting. Yeah. I don't know if it's exciting, but we can do another podcast on why I don't feel excited going to Pakistan <laughs> yeah, right now. that's true. That's true. Should we get back to the story? Yes. So this guy, Joshua Mast, has been in Afghanistan on a temporary assignment for the Center for Law and Military Operations. He's analyzing data on targets and collateral damage in combat zones. And he becomes interested in adopting Baby Doe, allegedly as a show of Christian generosity and as a way of getting better medical treatment for her. And after appeals by Mast to several members of the White House and the State Department, the U.S. Embassy organizes a joint meeting of the Red Cross, the Afghan government, and the U.S. military, including MAST. In that meeting, it is reiterated that the international humanitarian law that covers the situation dictates the baby will go to the next of kin. A gag order was enforced on all military personnel concerning the desired adoption, saying nobody should advocate on her behalf, and at the end of 2019, the U.S. Embassy locates a paternal uncle to Baby Doe who determines that his son and son's wife, young, educated newlyweds in close proximity to a hospital in Afghanistan, would be best suited to raise the baby. I agree with that, Asad. I think it should be next of kin, especially when they are educated, young, and they have means to raise the baby, right? So is there a precedence for the U.S. military adopting orphans during the war? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. Definitely not from Afghanistan. Adoptions of Afghan babies by Americans are very uncommon. They've only been, sadly, 14 in the last decade and only available to American Muslims of Afghan lineage. So you think about, like, this entire war that we've been in you know, for 20 years and only 14 have come in the last decade. It's really a small amount. Afghan law actually prohibits custody of Muslim children by non-Muslim non-Afghans. And also by law, if a paternal grandfather or brother cannot be located, custody goes to a paternal uncle. And absent of that, the Afghan children's court would determine who the new guardian is. Hmm, that's interesting. So Mast just totally disregarded these laws, customs, and was hell-bent on adopting baby doe. Yeah, for the reasoning that the baby like needed this complex medical attention, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So back home in remote Virginia, Mast and his wife keep appealing to government entities, then petition Virginia courts for custody under mostly false pretenses. He claims in court he only intends to bring baby Doe back to the U.S. for medical intervention at his cost, so he'll pay for it. He tells the Virginia mm. court that the baby's biological parents were terrorists, that her father used a suicide bomb to evade capture, that he killed himself and the five other kids, 
and that the mother was shot after resisting arrest. Thus, he claims that the baby was a stateless minor, that the Afghan government was waiving jurisdiction, which was untrue, and that she would likely become a child soldier or sex slave or be stoned or die in a military strike if left in Afghanistan. And that last point, Sadi, is just ridiculous that she would die in a military strike if left in Afghanistan. Like, that's what created the situation, right? Oh, my God, Asad. So this guy is making shit up. Yeah. And he is using every single trope every or trope. stereotype that he could come up with. This is so sad, Asad. But you know what? The worst thing is that in some instances, people may even believe. Right all these false claims, sure. right? So that's yeah. what worries me the most. That somehow the Virginia court would have jurisdiction over another country? Like, it just makes completely no sense. So, you know, Sadia, the Afghan couple and the now parents refute his terrorism claim, obviously, saying that the baby's immediate family were farmers at the, and that the military operation was a tragic mistake. And it's not far-fetched, you know, Sadia, 110 civilians were killed in the first week of September 2019 alone. And like tens of thousands of civilians have been killed in false you know military strikes just a crazy uh, amount of deaths but local residents said the strike killed 10 afghan civilians including seven children and zamari amadi not an isis k operative but an afghan engineer who had worked since 2006 for the california based charity group nutrition mast also claims that no dna test was done on the couple and questions the blood ties apparently the couple refused a dna test and you know why should they do it who is mass to them like yeah they can refuse right. it right for its part the red cross insisted that the couple is related and, you know, just to be clear, it's true that the nationality of the baby couldn't be proven, but by law, she was an Afghan citizen because that's where she was found. Eventually, though, the masts are awarded custody in Virginia, along with a certificate of foreign birth. The masts filed temporary restraining orders against the secretaries of defense and state and send a cease and desist order to the Red Cross. Just wild stuff. Regardless, though, the baby is flown to be with her relatives in early 2020. So she's back home in Afghanistan where, you know, she should be. Sadia, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about how the couple end up in the U.S. Welcome back to Invisible Heat. So Asad, how did the couple end up in the U.S.? Was masked in touch with the baby's relatives? How did it come about? So, yes, Ali, that's a great question. Mast hires an attorney named Kimberly Motley, who is the general counsel of Women for Afghan Women and was working in Afghanistan and hires her to be his eyes and ears. Once the Afghan couple is given the baby, Mast has Motley track them down and give him updates on the baby, including a photo that is later doctored for her passport. It should also be noted that the first attorney Mast hires is his brother, a Virginia attorney with a conservative Christian group. Given that both he and his brother have passed the Virginia bar, they know Virginia law quite well, Sadia. The rural setting and or mass influence assists in convincing Virginia courts to bypass various adoption precautions for example, there is a precaution to do six months of visits with an agency before finalizing, and that didn't happen, I guess. It's just like crazy that these protocols were skipped. Anyways, Mast is communicating with the adoptive couple from Virginia, initially through his attorney Motley and an interpreter who was a Baptist pastor of Afghan descent named Ahmed Usmani. And then eventually Mast directly starts communicating with the couple. Osmani, who is the interpreter, actually vouches for the masts, which helps them gain the trust of the couple and convinces the couple their only motive is medical assistance. Nobody reveals that legally the masts have a petition for custody. Mast insists that the baby needs extensive evaluation and treatment for potential blindness, brain injury, or physical disability from her injuries. But her new dad in Afghanistan, the cousin, 
has a medical background and disagrees with Mast, though he is concerned about the baby's facial scars, irregular walk, and allergic reactions. It's only during the upheaval of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan that Mast finally convinces the couple to temporarily relocate and flies them over to the U.S. And then Mast also, by the way, seeks to evacuate his interpreter siblings, vouching for Osmani as a, quote, very instrumental to helping a U.S. Marine adopt an Afghan child. As it to me, all of this sounds so bizarre. It's crazy. First, why is Mast obsessed with baby Doe, right? And second, if he wants to give baby Doe medical, or at least help baby Doe get medical assistance, then he could only focus on that and not worry about adoption. And I also see this tinge of white saviorism happening here. So a lot of things happening at the same time. And honestly, I don't understand his obsession and all that he's doing to get this baby. Do they have kids? Masts? Do they have kids? Yeah, they have a couple other kids. Right. So he's basically using the turmoil to his advantage, right? At this point. What happens next, Asad? Yeah, so the masts uh, meet the couple and the family in transit in Germany and try to convince them to let the baby travel with them alone to easy entry into the U.S., but the couple says no. I mean, such sketchy behavior. Mast then coaches the couple on what to say to immigration and custom officials and to refer anyone with questions over to him, their lawyer. So now he's trying to be their you know friend and lawyer type of thing. Mast obtains visas for the couple with a made-up status, and that status was Special Immigrant Afghanistan National Escorting Military Dependent. And then the Masts also meet the Afghan family again at Dulles Airport and present Baby Doe's passport with the surname Mast and her photo altered from the old photo. And he tells the couple that the passport was just created to obtain medical treatment more easily. A really psychotic behavior, Sahya. Right. I feel like there's something more to it, Asad. Yeah. No, no, I don't disagree. So when they land, the couple is taken to Fort Pickett Army National Guard Base. This is where the couple wanted to go because that's where other refugees are. And then on September 3rd, just five days after their arrival, the family is driven from the base to an undisclosed building and a State Department rep physically takes the baby from her car seat and brings her to Mrs. Mast. Joshua Mast allegedly stomps on the new dad's foot, shoves him, and leaves. The couple panic and they fear, like, you know, Mast and his power that he's kind of built up through this whole thing. And they initially ask the interpreter, Osmani, for help. And he says, you gotta avoid lawyers and deal with Mast directly, and that the court will never give this couple, who he says is poor, custody. The couple tries to navigate the complex U.S. legal system. They consult with the military, the State Department, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the police, and they eventually, you know, saw they get a lawyer. I said, what the actual fuck, right? This it's so is scary. so crazy. And it is so scary. And State Department is also involved because a State Department rep is physically taking the baby from the couple, which is crazy to me. And then... Mast has so much power. Usmani is also trying to manipulate the couple because they don't know how to navigate this complex U.S. legal system. I feel so bad for them, but I'm also so angry that it's not just Mast or the Masts. It's the entire system. The government is also involved Complicit. at some level. It seems like someone throughout this entire process should have stopped him from doing what he was trying to do, right? Like, that's why we have this justice system. That's why we have the courts. That's why we have customs. It's so mind boggling to me. And then to try to get into his mentality as well, like to feel like he's entitled to this child that he really has no connection to whatsoever, right? Like that's tens of thousands of miles away. It's to me, it's really psychotic behavior. And you're absolutely right, Asad. The word entitlement describes his behavior exactly. It all comes down to entitlement and what he thinks he can get away with. 
Sadia, let's take another quick break. And when we come back, we'll tell you the latest. Welcome back to Invisible Heat. So, Asit, this case is driving me nuts. <laughs> Tell me, what's the latest? Yeah, so the masts have had the girl, Baby Doe, for over a year now, about as long as the couple did. And they renamed her with an American name and are raising her with their four boys. The Afghan couple is still in the U.S. They live in Texas and cannot return to Afghanistan as of now for fear now of being targeted as U.S. military collaborators. Osmani, the interpreter, lives in Tennessee, and he claims that he was just a mere translator. And then the Afghan wife became suicidal after the baby was taken. I mean, Sadia, I can't imagine if someone were to take my 10-week-old right now. Like, that would destroy me if I wouldn't be able to see her for a year or two. Like, uh, it's mind-boggling to me. She has since had a biological daughter and evidently is buying matching outfits for her sister, the baby doe. This is so sad, I it's, said. It's, it's just ridiculously sad. Mast, for his part, is still an active duty Marine and he was recently promoted to major and they live in North Carolina now. No accountability, right? No accountability whatsoever. And the Masts have apparently spent a lot of money on her medical care and they claim they have discussed long-term commitment with the Afghan couple, including college for the baby. And then, you know, just recently, the Associated Press published a major report on the case, bringing really high-level attention to it. And so now there are multiple ongoing federal investigations and four different lawsuits. The Afghan couple filed a federal lawsuit in September 2022 against the Masts, their two lawyers and the interpreter for conspiracy, interference with parental rights, assault, fraud, emotional distress, and false imprisonment and are seeking a declaratory judgment, which basically is like a legal binding definition of rights and relationships among the parties, plus several million dollars of damages and legal fees. Another investigation by the government is looking into how Mast access of his own admission and retained classified documents about the initial raid on the baby's family. And the Marine Corps is actually cooperating on this. Wait, what does it? What does this even mean? I guess this is a detail that we should have brought up a little bit earlier. But basically what they're saying is that like a lot of the information about the family, about the baby was in classified documents that Mast should not have had access to. And so somehow he obtained those classified documents to get the ammunition to fuel his kidnapping. Mm -hmm. And so the Marine Corps is trying to figure out how he got access to those documents. And as we've seen from recent cases in the news, including from our president, you know, that can get you into a lot of trouble really quickly. Donald Trump has become the first president to face federal criminal charges as a grand jury in Florida indicts him over the mishandling of classified documents after leaving office. Political pressure is growing on President Biden after the FBI searched his home for nearly 13 hours Friday, found more classified documents. The documents date back to Biden's vice president. And for their part, the Department of Justice says the adoption should never have been allowed because of factual and legal misrepresentations and asked for the case to be moved from Virginia to federal court. But presiding circuit court judge named Richard Moore denied the motion. So yes, yeah, Sadia, the case is legally complex, slow moving, and there are a lot of uncertainty about facts. I mean, one thing though that is certain is that the Red Cross has relocated orphans for centuries and should be trusted. And that's something that Mast should have been aware of. And he should have also been aware of, you know, Afghanistan's laws and jurisdiction given his job. The Taliban for its part has said that it will pursue the, the issue with the American authorities um, so that the child is returned to her relatives. But, you know, Sadia, the main issue here is whether the Afghan couple has a right under Virginia law to challenge the adoption. That judge, Judge Moore, says they do, but the masts are appealing. It's also complex uh, diplomatically. The U.S. government recognizes that taking a foreign citizen could significantly harm relations and doesn't want to condone masts' actions but also doesn't want to return the girl to potentially unstable conditions, nor continue moving her around. An Afghan American organization referred to the masts as white saviors trafficking humans under the guise of Christian humanitarianism. 
And so, Sadia, the most recent update is that in March, basically, the Virginia judge voided the adoption. And so the masts, they don't have any legal standing to have the child in their custody. But the girl's future remains uncertain. For now, she's going to stay with the masts um, under a temporary custody order that they obtained before the adoption. And so now the masts have to go back to court to basically convince them again that they should be the permanent parents for baby doe. This is so complex, Asad, because if there has been a ruling in favor of Afghan couple in a way, right? Because yeah. the judge has voided a United States Marines adoption. Why can't the baby go back to Afghan couple? Why is the baby still with the masks and why do they have this option to reprove to the court that they should be granted a permanent adoption? Yeah, I, I really don't understand it at all. And to your point, it really makes no sense, right? Like we're essentially allowing these two kidnappers to continue to keep the baby under some sort of guise of like the continuity will be better for the baby now that she's around three years old. I, I don't know. I, I don't get it, but it's like it's... The whole thing is just so ridiculous, and I'm so glad that the Associated Press did a story on it and made it more aware. Uh, you got to think that there are other stories like this that are out there, and this, to me, is just like such a ridiculous, ridiculous story. Yeah, and our listeners may be thinking, I said, why are we covering this story? Because it doesn't fit into the conventional narrative around hate crimes, the first thought that comes to mind is because the Afghan couple were hate crimed in a way, and also that the baby has been subjected to a lot of trauma. And although the baby is still very young, we don't know what kind of repercussions or implications it will have on the baby as she grows older. Yeah, I mean, that's my two cents. Yeah, so Sadia, yeah, I think you're right. This isn't a traditional hate crime type of story that we've covered in the past, but I think there's so many of the uh, same kind of hallmarks of stories that we've covered in the past, just like how you know hopeless the victims are and how much they're hoping to rely on the courts for justice, and then the justice doesn't come or it takes a long time. You know, I think for me, this idea that under the guise of Christian humanitarianism, you know, someone can essentially traffic a little baby girl across the world with no consequences. You know, you wouldn't see a non-white person getting away with something like this, in my opinion. You're absolutely right, Asad. And it also sheds light on skewed power dynamic, right, that's happening and unfolding here. So it's a very sad story. And these stories hardly make it to mainstream media, right? right? So I'm so glad that you found this story and we covered it on today's episode. So I said, how can we help? Yes, yeah, so there's a couple ways that you can help. You can make a donation to the International Rescue Committee, the Red Cross of Afghanistan, or Save the Children, which assists people in humanitarian crises. You can also support the Afghan Adjustment Act, providing a pathway to lawful permanent status in the U.S. for Afghan evacuees. We'll have links in the show notes to that. As always, thank you for tuning in to Invisible Hate. If you want to learn more, check out the links in the show notes about the case. And uh, also, please email us your thoughts about this story or any other story that you think that we should cover. You can reach us at info at invisiblehatepodcast.com. You can also tweet us or hit us up on Instagram. Just search for Invisible Hate Podcast. Thank you again for listening. If you like what you hear, please, please share with a friend. Leave us a five-star review. Send us an email with your thoughts and feedback. We are always looking for new ideas and we want to know our listeners. What are you guys thinking? Invisible Hate is a joint production of Refilion Media and Immigrantly. We would like to thank our team, which includes Michaela Strathe, Emmanuel Monahan, Lindsay Gambu, and Paroma Chakravarti. Our music was done by Simon Hutchinson. We'll be back next week with another hate crime for us to analyze. Until next time, I am Sadia Khan. And I'm Asad Bhatt. Take care.